we are running a collective funding pilot during this summit. In a moment, we'll be sharing some of our latest work on community governance, and we'll be thinking about and discussing together how we can interview and invest in this area. Um, the ideas and insights in this discussion will be linked back to the community governance area in the collective funding exercise that will be we're running throughout the summit, um, and this will help inform our funding allocations in this exercise, hopefully. So you can have a look at the kind of current description of the funding area and whole budget using the link that uh, Anne just put in the chat, um, and we'll uh, sort of refine that and, and continue to improve that through this discussion and, and other ones. Before we begin, a little bit of a check-in. We'd like to find out more about your thoughts on um, this area of work. So uh, doing a little bit of a chatter fall. So write your response to the following question in the Zoom chat, but wait to press send until we say go. What interests you about community governance of open infrastructure? So please type, have a think, type your answer in the Zoom chat, but what, what brings you here? What interests you about community governance? Giving everyone a chance to think about this question. Why are we interested in community governance? Thank you so much for participating in this little exercise and I'm handing over to Richard. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I feel like we're all friends now, but I'll introduce myself again. I'm Richard Dunks, the Director of Research and Strategy here at IOI. Really excited to take you through this deep dive on governance. Um, with starting with some context setting about why we're interested in this work. Um, our goal, uh, if you're familiar with our uh, strategic plan that we've released publicly, um, one of those items is to understand foundational concepts necessary for building vibrant, resilient, and community-driven services to provide value to stakeholders. Um, but adhering to these essential principles, true openness and accountability. Um, and as part of that, we very early on understood that governance is very important in this, to be how that well-run organizations that are community-led, community-engaged, transparent, and accountable um, really requires good governance. So we, we endeavored to understand what governance looks like, why is governance important, and really make the case for it. Um, specifically, we wanted to be able to document and describe the current literature on nonprofit governance, as we've mentioned previously, you know, we've, we've really looked to the larger field of nonprofit management and leadership uh, to understand what's the state of the art there, what's the understanding, the frameworks, the concepts that are really important for us uh, to, to look at, but also looking at our own space, scholarly communication space, and, we, and ultimately to be able to improve our ability to advocate for more and better diversity, communication and open infrastructure services, um, and our, to better shape our own internal governance practices, to be more open, transparent, community-driven, we strongly believe that we have to lead by example in this. So it was an opportunity for us to better understand for ourselves what, uh, what good governance looks like for us, go through that journey so we can better advocate for governance uh, in the space, in the larger space that we, we're, we're in. Um, we've been very lucky to have two very talented uh, individuals working with us, researchers in this space. Um, you're going to hear from them today. Um, first off is uh, Raven. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in public policy and public political economy at the University of Texas, Dallas, and she has a passion for nonprofit excellence, building on her time as a founder and executive director of an immigration-focused nonprofit in the U.S. So she has the advantage of not only being a researcher, but also um, being involved in this, you know, as a director herself working with the board. Um, she's going to guide us through that nonprofit kind of larger view from the nonprofit leadership and management space on what governance is, literature there, and also have Sam Moore. Uh, who many of you are probably familiar with, a digital humanities scholar based at Cambridge, Cambridge University Library, and with a drive to understand the necessary components to make a scholarly commons not only possible, but viable in the long term. So, um, and, and Sam will be following Raven in, in her presentation. So Raven Klein, kick us off, please. All right. Okay. Um, well, I am Raven Klein, and um, I am a PhD student at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm excited to be here with you today to discuss um, what we've um, researched as far as governance is concerned. Um, first, I want to start with, with the questions that we're going to address during this presentation. So we're talking about what is governance, why it's important, what are some key concepts that we need to understand, and some important models of governance within nonprofit organizations. 
So what is governance? Um, from the original Latin, it means to steer and guide. And you will notice that within the research, their definitions within the research are built off of this um, standard definition. So nonprofit research governance includes accountability, fiduciary matters, um, which obviously includes finances and money management, but also includes decisions um, and how those are made, policy creation, adherence to those policies and revision when necessary, um, onboarding and dismissing of the executive director. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that relationship moving forward. And then protecting the mission and strategic planning. All right, and then why is governance important? Well, one is that it demands transparency. So whether we are um, letting our public know what policies we have, what our practices are, why we have those, how they work um, with our chosen population, um, disclosing our financial statements, um, that is transparency. Now, that level of transparency also helps to build trust. Um, and another thing that helps build trust is our communication. So we are communicating with our stakeholders, um, internal and external stakeholders um, via social media, email, newsletters, any other form of communication. The important part of this is that those stakeholders have the opportunity to respond and to give feedback. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. And then uh, governance is important because it maintains accountability for our outputs and our outcomes. So are the services that we're offering, are they accomplishing the goals that we say we're geared toward? And are those long-term um, accomplishments also in uh, fidelity with our mission? It solidifies nonprofits' reputation and their legitimacy. Um, so obviously, if we are being transparent and we are trustworthy and we are accomplishing what we say we're going to accomplish, um, the reputation is going to be good, but it also um, promotes our legitimacy as an organization for that chosen population within that community. Um, so fidelity to the mission is, is important. And then it encourages diversity and inclusion. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this as the slides move on as well. But maintaining feedback from various stakeholders, um, whether that is, you know, funders, clients, board members, um, co-collaborators from other sectors, um, maintaining that feedback. The, uh, the magic, I think, within the nonprofit organization, especially when you're dealing with diversity, is that all of these stakeholders are going to have various view, uh, viewpoints of the same organization. And so incorporating... Um, those viewpoints is going to be really interesting and help us to um, meet all the needs related to our mission. And then ensures awareness about the needs of the served population. And we're going to talk a bit more about representation in a minute. Okay. Before we get into representation, I want to review structure and function of the board. Um, board source mentions these six components, um, and they are the board meetings, um, where we discuss our decisions, our ideas, new opportunities, um, our strategic planning, saying, setting a goal to where we want to be, realizing where we are, creating a plan to get there, um, often include committees, timetables, of course, and task forces. Um, streamlined structure um, allows the board and the staff to operate in tandem toward the mission. We're going to get into that a little bit more as we talk about um, models of governance. And then composition of the board and, and the staff. So we want to make sure that um, we have the most appropriate people in the most appropriate positions and that they are all in line with our mission. And then leadership of the board and the organization, um, the board chair and the executive and the relationship between those two. And we're going to talk a little more about that as well. And then, of course, the mission. Mission drives everything, as we know, and so it is. It is crucial. All right. So, some key concepts, uh, some other key concepts related to the relationship of the board. So, we looked at a se several theories in this literature review, and one of them is principal agent. So, um, as you may know, the principal is the party who hires an agent to do uh, 
something on their path. In this particular situation, we're talking about the relationship between the board and the executive director. And although this relationship can change based on the model of the board, um, typically most, um, most boards use a policy model in which the executive director is agent to the board. And um, we will discuss that um, in the next slide as we talk about models. We also discussed the stakeholder theory, um, like I just described, whether that is internal or external stakeholders. Um, the, the board has a responsibility to the community, not only to achieve its mission, but also to hear um, what each stakeholder, what the stakeholders have to say um, about um, the policies and procedures. And then representative bureaucracy, like I said a few slides ago, um, representation is important. In this particular relationship between the board and the community, we're looking at um, whether or not a board, a community member is on the board. So if within the served population, a member of that served population sits on the board, then that representative member not only has access, firsthand access to what that community needs, but they also have a voice to meet that need and to direct the organization. Okay, so a couple of models that we discussed and uh, before we start, I want to note that this is on a continuum, um, although there are three listed here, um, these um, boards can, organizations can function on different levels within this continuum and may change during the lifestyle of any organization. So the policy board created uh, originally by Carver, John Carver, is basically when um, the board the board sets the policy, sets the rules, practices. The executive director is the person who is management. Is what they call that person in the literature, and their role is to um, make sure that those policies, practices, and procedures are being enacted within the organization. They then report back to the board, and they can make suggestions for changes if that becomes necessary. Um, but the board, I'm sorry, the executive is agent to the principal who is the board. In the executive centered, um, it is the other side of the spectrum in which the executive is central to government, so to governance. So the executive director may set policies, um, may handle fiduciary matters, keeps the board informed, um, encourages the board about new opportunities, and may even set standards for the board of directors. Um, so they are the governance leadership, but they are also still maintaining their management role of making sure that policies are enacted within the um, within the organization. The board-centered model um, is a mixture of these two. So it's located in the spectrum, it's located in the middle of these two. Um, the executive director may be the person who establishes the vision, the mission, the values of the organization, but the board may be the one who deals with the financial matters, the strategy, these two work in tandem. There is not necessarily a hierarchy like there is in the policy board. Um, the board may also be responsive to staff if there's a crisis situation, and they may also engage feedback from staff during times of change um, to inform their decision making. And as you see below, um, the contingency model indicates that, the, that there is no right model. Um, it is contingent on the internal structures and the environment, internal and external environment of the organization. Okay. And some key findings. Um, so is that governance is foundational to managing success, whether that is finances, fundraising, our reputation, our structure, and the longevity of our organization, whether it's programming or maintaining morale. Good governance is essential to accomplishing our mission and many of the needs of the principal. And good governance is vital for transparency, accountability, and trust. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Moore. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. So I'm, I'm Sam Moore. Um, yeah, the, the scholarly communication specialist at the University of Cambridge. Um, so I am going to talk about a piece of work that I did for IOI over the summer around community governance of, of open infrastructures um, for kind of scholarly communication services. 
So, so the work was was guided by kind of these these three main questions. Um, why why is good governance essential for scholarly communication infrastructures? I mean, Raven's just sort of talked quite a lot about why it's essential, so I won't go into this too much. Um, but I'm, I'm talking about things like academic publishing um, organizations, data infrastructures, repositories, etc. Uh, primarily, these are sort of market driven and, and therefore sort of governed by the market um, in the context of just buying and selling. And um, and so, where does the community fit into that? I guess is one thing I was interested in. So, so what then, the second question is, what then does, does governance look like in scholarly communication? Um, how can it be improved? Um, and then once we have this sort of idea of how it might be able to improve, how can we actually embed an improved form of governance into scholarly communication infrastructures and services? Those are sort of the three questions that, that guided the research. So this was uh, kind of the method was sort of a tripartite approach. Um, on the one hand, there's been, I wouldn't say a flurry, but there's been a lot of, of literature about community governance um, in scholarly communication over the last few years. Um, so, so firstly, it was sort of desk research of this literature um, to understand what, what, what do people know that we've, we've already found out. Um, so the COPEN project, which is the community-led open publishing infrastructures for monographs project has done, they have a whole work package dedicated to community governance of infrastructures. Um, and that's in the context of, um, of open access book publishing. Um, and so looking at the work they've done, Educopia, I know we have Catherine here, um, so kind of drawing on, on the work on the community cultivation guide and, and mapping the scholarly communication landscape. And then my own kind of scholarly background is in um, the literature on the commons, um, which is to say sort of the, the ways in which communities come together to self-manage um, resources and share resources. So, so, so Eleanor Ostrom is kind of the archetypal um, theorist of the commons, um, and, and she sort of occupies quite a, um, well, she, a lot of her work is around um, how communities have sort of come together in quite sort of formal circumstances to design rules to manage particular um, particular resources. Um, and her, her approach um, influenced um, the governing knowledge commons framework um, and those kinds of things. And they're, but they're all situated in quite a rational space, um, sort of rational economic actors. Um, and I also drew on um, what you might call more sort of left political approaches, such as Massimo De Angelis and Stavros Stavridis. Uh, um, and they sort of take the starting point that we are sort of community bound and we're already doing this. Um, and how do we sort of um, embed that in, in other ways, I guess. So just looking at those sort of um, the literature on the commons, which is quite, um, there's lots about literacy about the commons from a variety of political perspectives. Um, and then secondly, looking at um, project analysis of, of the actual governance approaches in the scholarly communication space. So IOI did their projects on the catalog of open infrastructure services, where we saw that a lot of governance in scholarly communication is not as um, thoroughgoing as it could be. Um, that's not to say it doesn't exist, but it could be formalized or improved and such. Um, and then I also drew upon um, project analysis of um, kind of organizations that, that do it best than others, I guess. Um, and there's a few listed here. Um, I'll talk a bit about ORCID in a minute, um, but these are, these are sort of a bit better than, than the average, I guess. And then analyzing their mission statements and their vision statements and their bylaws um, and principles and all of these things that go into making up good governance, the things that you sort of need. Um, and then kind of drawing on these two things, I then came up with what I'm calling a sort of speculative proposal for a minimum viable system of governance and what that might look like for scholarly communication. And that 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 requires a lot more work, but I just identified a few elements that need to be, um, I guess, sort of thought about. Um, so on the first, oh, so that slide's a bit messy. Um, so, so, so sort of the report is divided into two different um, sections, part one and part two. Um, so the first part is um, identifying that good governance requires consideration of, kind of a number of different elements. So I tried to sort of identify what these kind of features are. So um, on the one hand, you have like things like the organization size, its scale, um, the ambition and the complexity of the organization. And you have to note that governance does not actually scale very well. The bigger an organization it gets, the harder it is to actually um, govern, particularly from a community, um, if more and more users are using it. Um, and then alongside that, we have kind of what are the actual structures um, for external and internal accountability. So if we, we identify the organization, sort of how it's structured, but then what are the actual um, ways in which 
the organization is held to account. Um, and I've listed things like, again, the mission and the values and the rules and this idea of polycentricism, the bigger an organization it gets, the more centers it needs in, the, in order to um, devolve different forms of power within the organization. And then finally, situatedness, which is this kind of um, quite ephemeral concept, but, but that's sort of drawing on the more, again, these more left approaches that um, it's quite hard to put into words what, what makes a community, what its norms are and its, and its diversity and what um, makes it trust one another and the shared effort that goes into producing a particular goal. These things are absolutely vital. And I think they're probably the most important, but they're also the hardest thing to actually identify. You can't put these things necessarily into writing. So, so there are no off the shelf models for community governance, I'm afraid. It's every community would be different. Um, Ostrom actually points us towards kind of different models that um, have been successful in, in the past. So she has a framework, the IAD framework, that kind of studies um, why some communities are more successful at governing their work than others. Um, but the, the, the thing to reiterate, I guess, is that accountable governance then is, is not actually done too well in the scholarly communication spaces. Um, and that the better approaches are the ones drawing on what Raven just talked about, the not-for-profit not ones, the ones who are legally forced to think about these things. So ORCID is a very good example of a non-profit with very, I would say, quite robust governance um, documentation and procedures. And they have very um, well set out boards and bylaws and all these kinds of things. Um, but they do that primarily because they're, they're a large organization that kind of has to do it, I think. <clears throat> which is not a bad thing necessarily. And so then kind of building on all that kind of stuff then in part two, I think about kind of what might a speculative approach of um, uh, towards governance might be. So, so there are no off the shelf models, um, but these are sort of the following elements that are necessary to consider and actually define for good governance. A lot of this comes down to it in the first instance that we want to see transparency and we want to see organizations simply setting this stuff out and if they don't have it we want to know that they haven't got it so to define the organizational structure and ideally a rationale for why the organization is structured in certain in, in that kind of way so how is decision making accountable and how is it embedded into the organization structure does this mean multiple boards a hierarchical approach uh, an informal approach a horizontal approach uh, that kind of stuff is sort of really important to determine from a community governance perspective and then democratic process actually once you have the structure what is the what is the the way that this organization runs who owns the organization if you want to sell the organization or or shut it down how does that work so these things are all kind of um identifiable in non-profit kind of governance approaches but we want to make them um i guess for smaller organizations we want to make them kind of the first thing they do so who can make decisions and um, what are bylaws um, what are conflict resolution mechanisms etc and then finally these kind of norms and values it would be great if, if if organizations could sort of actually define what their values are and and their norms and how they work and the way they work because that's the sort of understanding that kind of how the organization is culture is the, is the way that it becomes um, governed i guess um and, and as I said, it's, it's absolutely vital that these elements are documented public, publicly. So in the first instance, even if we don't get better governance, um, or even if I haven't got anything to point to that says this is the best way to do it, just making it transparent, what you're doing already, um, I think will help massively. So, so I've just kind of listed a few next steps, I guess, because this is really a nascent area that, that requires a lot of um, research to explore how to actually embed um, these kind of standards into, into, into actual organizations. Um, so could we develop this into a toolkit or a, or a kind of choice architecture that allows organizations to develop accountable governance? So something that they can enter into a space that they enter into that allows them to think of particular things with their community. And then at the end, some sort of governance model comes out of that. Now, it's, again, it's hard because there's no off the shelf model. It's quite hard to think to, to sort of see how that will work. It, I think that requires quite a lot of research to get that done right. Um, so how do we, but how do we embed governance then from a project's creation? Because a lot of issues around governance is simply because 
um, they started by a handful of people or a benevolent dictator who just wants to get things done, which is absolutely great, but governance is an afterthought. So how do we embed it from a project's creation? So that's something I think funders could do a lot for. Um, and then how do we ensure that it's responsive to how an organization actually grows? If we consider that governance is a process rather than a thing, it's going to be a living thing that's continually kind of growing as the organization grows. And then finally, how do we utilize those users of pre-existing infrastructures. This is a sort of an antagonistic space in many respects. We don't like big publishers. We don't like these big profit-making organizations because they're unaccountable. So how do we actually um, work out ways to, to intervene in these, in these organizations through, for instance, um, editorial boards or reviewers or authors or users? Um, what, what kind of interventions can be designed there that sort of says, if if, if we're going to work with you, we want you to do X, Y, and Z. And those things don't really exist at the moment because it's all quite, <clears throat> excuse me, it's all quite market driven. So um, I think I will leave it there. And there's a slide for discussion coming up. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, two really quick things. Um, it's a great facilitator when my presenters um, finish exactly on time as both of these did today. So thank you so much to both of you. And I hope also you all can see what a great joy my job is when I get to work with talented individuals like this, as well as Naomi, who you saw earlier, Tanya as well, and the whole of the IOI team. So um, it's it, these are great conversations we have internally about all these fun, interesting topics. So thank you both for your presentations.